Welcome back everyone to ABG Investor Days. My name is Henrik Kinse and I'm an equity research analyst here at ABG. With me now I have John Westberg, CEO of Clavister. John will present the company for us and after that I'll ask some questions. Please John, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, as mentioned, I'm Jon Westberg. I'm one of the co-founders of Clavister, uh, also the CEO since uh, 2017. Uh, we'll speak a day about you know, what we refer to as Swedish cybersecurity in an unsecure world. Um, first, some quick backgrounds about Clavister for those of you who don't know us. We were founded back in 1997 as one of the, actually one of the earliest cybersecurity vendors in Sweden, actually one of the earliest one in Europe. Uh, at that time, back in 1997, there was only one main incumbent vendor being Checkpoint Technologies out of Israel and US. Uh, today, the company has grown its portfolio. So ranging from our original offering being firewalls for civilian or enterprise um, usage. We've now broadened that to include firewalls for a wide range of applications, civilian use, defense usage, telecom usage. We have a, an area of identity and access management solutions, which is highly relevant in, in these days of remote working. And our latest offering includes cloud security that we've been working on for, for a while now. Uh, we are listed on Nasdaq First North since 2014 and we emphasize the fact that our products are entirely developed in Sweden. This is highly relevant when it comes to cybersecurity and the trust of technology origin, given the fact that most of today's cyber technology originates from either US, China, uh, to some degree Israel and to a smaller degree nowadays uh, Russia. Uh, we are focusing on what we refer to as mission critical applications, namely customer or customer groups where the, the, the financial loss could be massive, the reputation loss could be massive, and where the importance of this technology origin is highly relevant. And I'll come back to that in a while. Uh, this is something you know, of course. I mean, we have a geopolitical situation that is quite dramatic. Um, we have a Europe that's been seeing a completely different you know, reality, a new world. And especially in the cyber area, it's, it's very, very tangible as well. Um, we're seeing not only cyber attacks originating from Russia towards Ukraine or Russia from, to, towards other parts of Europe or other parts of the society, but also an, sort of an escalation of cyber attacks in general. Uh, the type of attacks we see <clears throat> are also a bit, you know, changing from what we've been, been used to in the past. So this is just a snapshot from early May, so, you know, not, not more than one month old. We see attacks towards the French Parliament, against the Dutch Senate, against the Dutch justice systems, against, you know, even here in Sweden, the Swedish tax agency were attacked some weeks back. Uh, municipalities in, in, in uh, Italy, healthcare, Swedish parliament was attacked, the Swedish press agency, and so forth. So, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg, obviously, but what you can see is that we're not looking at the average optician or car workshop here. We're looking at um, parts of the society which is really critical, mission critical. The type of threat actors are also different compared to the past. Um, we're not obviously originating all the attacks from Russia only, but it serves as a good example, obviously, given what's, what's, what's happening in the world. So this is just a snapshot, an example of a few threat actor groups and their relationship typically to the Russian special services. Some directly associated, some being sponsored with some kind of a so-called firewall in between. Um, but, but clearly, most of today's threat actors have associations with state or state actors in one way or the other. And that's a big difference because, as you can imagine, the resources, the, the sort of political views and, and you know, the, the sustainability and, and you know, the, the time that these threat actors have to their possession is quite different compared to the individual hacker or the individual, you know, uh, financial crime group. So this is something different. It's one very practical example. Um, 
part of the Russian military uh, intelligence, GRU. This group is known to be behind the big attacks in Ukraine towards the energy sector, towards um, Mursk, towards other uh, you know, large attacks. Obviously well hidden, probably never going to get um, placed behind bars, but a good example or bad example, if you like, of a very motivated, very well sponsored group. Uh, the challenge that we see and, and many of the companies in our industry see is what we call a misalignment between digitalization and cyber maturity. Regardless of what statistics or what reports you look at, you see sort of the same trends. Sweden being in the absolute top in digitalization in Europe, uh, you know, could differ between one or, or, or two or three places, but typically Sweden is in top. That's good, obviously, I mean, that's, that's really flattering. What's not so flattering is how Sweden ranks in cybersecurity maturity. And again, regardless of the report you look at, Sweden ranks among the lowest. The delta or the discrepancy that this creates is really opening up for a huge vulnerability for society. So high level of digitalization, which is good, but the maturity to respond to threats super low. And you see sort of similar trends among all the other countries as well. Sweden maybe sticks out as being the most dramatic difference, but you know, you see a similar analogy. What we as Clavester has done to help in this matter is addressing our effort towards four main target customer groups. The common thread among those customer groups are that they represent mission critical applications, typically um, industries or, or sectors that are highly digitalized, but also highly relevant for society. If these suffer from a cyber attack, the consequences are dire. We're a small company still, you know, 100 employees roughly, so we can't span, span over all the various industries in the world. We have focused on a few. Public sector in Europe, um, including municipalities, regions, uh, state agencies and so forth. Critical infrastructure, mainly then the energy sector. And given what we've seen in Ukraine, this is an area that is completely underfinanced when it comes to cybersecurity. Defense, which I will get back to in a while, and telecommunication. The reason why I chose to talk more about defense here is mainly due to quite an interesting announcement we made last week. Um, I could speak long about the other offerings as well, but we have short of time, so defense will be the focus. The portfolio we have in defense today has grown to become quite broad. It started off as using our firewall technology in certain specific applications within defense, but over the past year, we've expanded that offering to include also um, our more standardized firewalls being used in, in defense or military data centers. Uh, Eurofighter is one of our reference customers in that area. We use our knowledge within 5G or 4G LTE security in order to support cyber security also in the private mobile networks that are being built for defense purposes. We have our identity and access management solution that is you know, starting to seamlessly blend into the cyber defense offering as, as well. And our latest addition being our artificial intelligence. Every reputable company needs an AI offering, obviously, including Cloudster. We acquired a company one and a half year back that uh, has a very, very mature, very powerful AI technology. We have now incorporated that into our portfolio and demonstrated that in use with, with our customers to be able to detect anomalies, you know, zero day attacks and quite sophisticated threats. Uh, <clears throat> last week we announced a, what we call a, a design win, which I'll come back to what that is, with uh, Europe the, the European branch of General Dynamics. Uh, General Dynamics obviously is one of the largest defense contractors in the world, uh, in par with BA Systems and, and others. Uh, European Land Systems is their European branch, approximately 2,400 employees headquartered in Spain, in Madrid. 
Uh, this picture is from the FindDef uh, event that was held last week, where representatives from the Swedish defense, the Swedish ambassador to, to Madrid, um, also representatives obviously from General Dynamics and from Cluster, held a quite big event to announce this partnership. Uh, the portfolio of General Dynamics, you know, quite obvious, defense platforms of various kinds, both wheeled uh, uh, vehicles and tracked vehicles, uh, also some, some other portfolio components that we're not part of. The design win that we announced is part of the, Nev the NEVA architecture. NEVA, short for New Electronic Vehicle Architecture. So this is essentially an investment that General Dynamics is making to modernize their fleet of, of, of uh, vehicles. And what you see in the background here is from the trade show, a vehicle from General Dynamics. Uh, you see the NEVA, you see Cyber Securidad um, and the Clavister logo behind. So basically, Clavister being appointed as the cybersecurity provider to this new architecture. So essentially, what this means is that any future vehicle coming out of General Dynamics European branch that goes for this new architecture will potentially have Clavister technology inside. I'm saying potentially because this is a design win. Then obviously various defense programs start, various contracts are to be signed, various you know, uh, configurations are to be established. So um, it's still a journey bef before we see cash flow from this deal, but this is exactly how our relationship started with BA Systems as well. So a very important milestone. And given the fact that they are publicly announcing it, obviously holds for something. <clears throat> I'd just like to explain a few words on, um, on, on the offering from General Dynamics and the potential behind. This is one of their platforms. It's called the ASCOD platform, the ASCOD vehicle. This is a tracked combat vehicle or infantry vehicle. It's sort of in the same family as the BA System CV90 or Rheinmetall Lynx product. Um, Approximately 1,000 vehicles produced to date, uh, mainly being used by Spain, United Kingdom and Austria. This is more or less the same magnitude as the footprint, current footprint of the BE system CV90. They have roughly 1,100 or 1,200 vehicles in operation today. The opportunity at hand for Clavister includes what we refer to as a midlife upgrade. So typically after some 10 years or so, these type of vehicles need to be upgraded. When they are upgraded, you replace, you know, upgrade engines, you upgrade uh, battle command systems and the electronic systems. And as part of that, the new architecture could come handy in. There is a new program that was recently commenced by the Spanish army. <clears throat> this program uh, aims for replacing 2000 vehicles of a completely different type. Um, called M113, with the new Ascot vehicle. This is a program that is scheduled to start in 2024 with the first deliveries. Obviously, this could serve as a fantastic potential for us if, if the product is being included in that program. Uh, General Dynamics have a second vehicle as well called the Piranha vehicle. This is a wheeled uh, vehicle. Um, competing, for instance, with Patria and their wheeled vehicle. This has a much broader installed base. We're looking at 11,000 vehicles in operation today. Um, some of the operators include the Swedish army, the Danish army, the Swiss army, and the Spanish army, of course. Same here, when these type of vehicles um, are up for a midlife upgrade, then that could serve as a business potential for, for Clavister. What more is that there is a consortium called TESS uh, include, included uh, with, with General Dynamics. It's also Indra, a big infrastructure provider, uh, and others. They will deliver, this consortium will deliver 348 new vehicles of this model to the Spanish army. But there is also an upside with potential up to 1,000 vehicles. So quite big investments being carried out by the Spanish army. Uh, with General Dynamics. So all in all, fantastic potential here. Some of you might have seen this slide before, but obviously now when 
we made this announcement, it's time to update this slide. Since before, we have our framework agreement with BA Systems. We have our first design win for the specifically for the CV90 platform. We've won already two defense programs, the first one in Nor Norway, the second one in Holland. Uh, there are a number of prospects, and you have probably seen the fantastic order intake that, that BA Systems have recently, so the list of prospects are obviously longer. The first ones at hand include Slovakia and Czech Republic, quite uh, quite large amount of vehicles. With General Dynamics, we can now add to this yet another design win for the Neva architecture with the prospects that you just saw in the previous slide. So both the Ascot vehicle and the Piranha vehicle represents then uh, different kinds of prospects and of course others as they go for, for ad additional defense programs. Uh, besides General Dynamics, we continue to work with other contractors, including Saab, including MBDA in Italy, uh, Eurofighter and so forth. Um, so hopefully, over time, this slide will become very busy. It starts to be busy already now. Uh, before leaving for Q&A, um, a bit of the numbers of Clavister. We introduced a new metric as of our previous interim report, our Q1 report, uh, annual recurring revenue. Reason being that we shifted business model approximately one year ago, moving away from a dominant perpetual or one-time revenue model to a more recurring subscription-based revenue model. And as it goes, obviously, annual recurring revenue is the market de facto term for, for that. Uh, year over year, we have been able to grow our recurring revenues with 16%. So by 31st of March, we ended with approximately 109, 110 million sec of recurring revenues. Uh, so this is all from our software licensing contracts that sort of keep on fe feeding us with recurring revenues as we go. In terms of other key metrics, um, order intake, you see quite a clear drop year over year, um, rolling 12 months. This is explained by specifically this new business model. When we change business model, um, when any company changes from perpetual to recurring, we experience a drop in, in, in top line. The reason why order intake is dropping is typically before we saw average of three, four, maybe even five years worth of contracts that we signed immediately. And that, of course, drives top line in terms of big order intake. With the new model, we see typically 12 months contracts and then recurring. That, that's the explanation for that. Net sales, uh, growing, clear trend. Uh, in terms of our gross margins, we set out an objective to have above 80% of gross margin. Uh, with some few exceptions, we've been able to maintain that level. And as we see more and more effect from our recurring software contracts kicking in over time, this level will slowly but surely continue to, 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 to climb. Um, we might have from quarter to quarter, you know, out, out ships of or larger volumes of hardware that would you know, temporarily reduce gross margin, but the trend is quite clear. Uh, and, and last, but maybe most importantly, our EBITDA trend. You know, when going back a few years, uh, starting 2019, we saw quite some heavy losses on EBITDA levels. We've been able to, to move this trend upwards, and Q1 was the first running 12 months worth of positive EBITDA ever in this company history. But it, we also had three, three quarters of successive positive EBITDA. So obviously big milestone. <clears throat> and if we look at our outlook going forward, this is the same outlook that we talk about in our interim report as well. Um, our ambition now is to continue to grow our top line growth, to continue to accelerate that, to reach approximately 20% or above that for the the, the three consecutive years now in average. The drivers behind that is obviously orders that we have already secured, signed with, within Defense, for instance, but also the average or the general improvements we're making in other parts of business. Uh, we've reduced our cost base quite significantly over the year, so that will continue to 
in combination with the increased top line, of course, will continue to have a positive effect on both EBITDA and, and cash flow. So we still maintain the, the outlook that we should achieve positive operational cash flow in the second half this year. So with that, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's move on to some questions. Uh, so given the recent uh, events in the world, could you talk a bit more about how this has affected uh, your company specifically? Have you seen a strong increase in demand following this? How do you think this will develop? I mean, obviously we, we have. There is no secret that you know, the geopolitical situation has just exploded the defense budgets. And that, as, as we see in the demand in the pipeline we're building in defense, it has a spillover in our defense, uh, defense business. Um, a few words on the other businesses, if we take our identity and access management business, for instance, that had a good impact, a, a big driver was the remote office, the, the entire effects of the pandemic uh, was driving that business. And we, can see, we continue to see that being, being driven. Um, given that we have picked four customer groups that are less sensitive to the sort of overall economy, I think we're not that affected, um, at least not yet, by the overall sentiment on, on the market, the inflation and so forth. Uh, public sector, obviously not that affected. Uh, defense, absolutely not affected. Critical infrastructure, less affected, I would say. Maybe in telecom, we see a bit more hesitation in taking on new capex investments because of the, the overall economy. But, but that's, that's the one. So, do you currently see the, the highest potential in the defense uh, segment of your business, or uh, could you talk a bit more about how you view the potential of the different uh, absolutely. Uh, segments? So, I, I think what, what we see is that our base business, if we can refer to it as that being our firewall business in general, our identity business, those represent quite high volumes. Uh, recurring revenues, stable growth, but not hockey stick growth, but stable growth. Uh, those will continue to evolve, and, and that's where we essentially base our sort of cost structure on. We, we should be able to maintain our business just with those two, because they are stable, they are predictable. Then defense, obviously given the size of the orders and the potential, serves as a perfect you know, leverage on top. But also, of course, with more more uh, troubles to to predict properly long lead times and and you know rollout times are typically over many many years but absolutely in terms of, of absolute numbers and potential defense sticks out positively mm -hmm. uh, all right thanks for that uh, you spoke a bit about the numbers uh, at the end here uh, and as we could see you EBITDA has been trending uh, upwards, uh, I assume, as you've gained scale uh, in the business. Could you give any comment on what kind of scale the, the company needs to reach to, to reach profitability? I mean, we, we, if, if we continue on the track we're right now, you know, the, the trends that we've been showing, um, as I mentioned, we should, be, we should be able to reach positive cash flows operationally um, in the second half. So we're not that far away. And it has been obviously helped by the combination of both being able to drive top line and at the same time quite dramatically reducing OPEX. Those, you know, the net effect you get from those drives EBITDA and, and cash flow very positive for us. Mm. All right, so, so let's finish off with uh, a bit of dreaming. Where would you like to see the company in five years? I mean, obviously, we, we, we would like to see much higher top line numbers, of course. And I think given the verticals we're in, that's not unrealistic. Um, we just need to make sure that we stay focused on the execution plan that we have and continue to build this momentum that we have and not dream away and, and go haywalk. Uh, we, we need to stay focused, that's, that's clear. Um, but I think we're also geographically right now limited to qu quite few you know, geographies. That serves as a, you know, as a blueprint, I would say, to gain growth in other areas of the world. But first things first, we, we should reach our targets first and then we can scale from that. Thank you very much, Jan. That's all we have time for. Thank you. And thank you all for listening.